Thank you for joining our New Life Bible study entitled, The Good News Doctor, taught by Pastor Alan Brooks. The New Testament book of Luke examines in detail the life and ministry of Jesus and is written with the warmth and compassion of a good old-fashioned family doctor. Prepare your hearts and minds for what God has for you personally as Pastor Alan leads us in our study. Well, good morning. So what a difference a day makes, right? Wow, beautiful day out there. Hopefully we'll get a chance to enjoy some of it later. But um, an exciting day for us, an emotional day for us, as most of you know from our celebration in between. We'll have more about that towards the end. But I just want to encourage you in being here today. I do believe that God has a divine appointment with us every Sunday. And some Sundays more than others, right? And so maybe this is your Sunday if it hasn't been there before. I want to start by asking this question. Who is the most important person? I mean, like a VIP that you've ever met. Shout it out if, if you've got it. So, What's that? Oh, your husband. <laughs> that was pretty cool, right? Where's my wife saying that stuff? <laughs> yeah. Bob Lilly. Bob Lilly. Okay, uh, a professional football field huh? or player, yeah. But Dick Cheney. Okay, wow. Johnny Cash. Oh, really? Wow, the founder of that. Wow, that's amazing. You know, I've not really been privileged to meet that many famous people that I'm aware of. Um, I knew a guy years ago that was the MVP in the um, World Series, um, and obviously used to like name drop that every once in a while when I got a chance, as we typically do. And I actually got a limo ride from a couple soap opera stars. That's a whole nother story. But... Um, the real question here with this, though, is what is it that makes a person important like that? Makes them a VIP? Some of it, if you think about it, it has to do with your own value system. You know, if you value position, obviously somebody who's the, a great leader of a company or a government or whatever the case might be, that might be a person that you consider as a VIP. Somebody who's very talented in a particular area, like a football player or a musician or something, that might be for you a person who's very important. A celebrity who's very good at acting or whatever the case might be. Today we're going to look at a person who I would suggest to you was definitely a first century VIP. And so we're going to take a look at him, and we're going to look together to see what we can discover from his life that would help our life. If you haven't done so already, I just ask you to turn to Luke chapter 19, and we're going to continue our study in this series. We're actually in the very first verse today. Jesus, for those of you that may not have been a part of this study so far, has been making his way to Jerusalem. And this is right prior to him being arrested and all else that happened. But it says that he entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they, that's the crowd, saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. We've talked about this place a little bit already in our study last week, this place called Jericho. And there's some things that if you'll pay close attention to what your text says, it says that he entered into Jericho. This ties into something I presented to you last week that kind of explains some differences between the gospel accounts of Jesus in the Jericho area. There were two of them if you missed that study. This almost certainly would be the new Jericho. This is the town that was rebuilt by King Herod. He did it in part because he was looking for a place to spend the winters. And that area, Jericho, down close to the Dead Sea, was very temperate year-round. Hotter than all get out during the summer, but during the winter months, nice. And so King Herod built a palace down there. 
And because a lot of the people that traveled to Jerusalem, when they came from the south up alongside the Dead Sea, they would actually go through Jericho. People that came from the north out of the area of Galilee and down along the Jordan River, they too would enter into Jericho before they would go up to Jerusalem. I shared this last week, but Jericho is 3,500 feet below Jerusalem, partly because Jericho is 800 feet below sea level. And so it's a pretty good climb. As I've indicated here on the graphic, is it's about 11 miles distance between Jericho and Jerusalem. But if you add in that it's 3,500 feet up, that adds for a pretty serious climb. And very often they would not take that climb late in the day in order not to be caught at night trying to go up there, along with the thieves and some of the other things that we know the Scripture reveals about that. One other thing that you sometimes miss is notice what it says. It says that he was passing through. It would seem that it was not an intention to stop here, at least not an intention that the disciples knew about. We also run into this local VIP. His name is Zacchaeus. I would suggest that he's probably the kind of person that, at least in our world, you would need an appointment to see him. You know, he's got a receptionist, he's got a personal assistant. There's layers of people that you would have to normally get through to be able to talk to this guy. He is, as the text reveals to us, a tax collector. Tax collectors in the first century in Israel were almost always Jewish. They had been recruited by the Romans to collect the tax money from their fellow Jews. And very oftentimes, they made a deal with the Romans to do that. A deal being they paid to get the roll to be able to collect the taxes. The way they made their profit was this. The Romans told them, this is how much tax we want collected. They profited by adding an amount to that tax for their own livelihood. They were notorious for charging exorbitant rates of taxes. In fact, what they could do, if you could not pay, they would sometimes offer to loan you the money so that your taxes would be paid. And a little bit like the payday loans of our world, does anybody know about those? I mean, those places are insane. I was doing a study this week that says if you took $100 out for a two-week period of time from payday loans, they will charge you an average of $15 to $35 for that. And if you work out the interest rate on that to an annual rate that we would normally associate, we're talking 300 to 700% annually. That's how big of an exorbitant interest rate that they're tagging on. And that's what these tax collectors in the first century were notorious for doing. Not only that, but because they were Jews, the law that God had given Moses said very clearly that they were not char- supposed to charge interest to their brother Jews. So this guy was very clearly violating the law of Moses and doing that. Also notice that Zacchaeus is no ordinary tax collector. What else does the text here tell us about him? He's the only one we hear this about, but he is the chief tax collector which means he's the head honcho, which almost certainly means that he has other tax collectors that report to him. And here's how that system often works. They're adding an amount to get their cut, but when they come to him, what's he want? He wants a cut on top of their cut. So they're having to collect more because they know Zacchaeus is going to take some of it off the top for himself. That's this guy that we're looking at here. Now, keep in mind, the passage tells us that at least materially, Zacchaeus was rich. There was no middle class in first century Israel. There were the poor, which was probably about 90 plus percent of the population, and then there were the very rich. There was nobody in the middle. You either had a lot of money or possessions, or you had almost nothing. In fact, most of them lived hand to mouth. You know, they just were hoping the crops came in, all that, just barely making it in the first century. So this guy's like totally on the other end of the financial spectrum. Do you think he was well-liked by the people in his neighborhood? (laughs) Not at all. This guy would have been despised. I've shared with you before, but tax collectors could not even testify in a Jewish court. That's how despised they were. Synagogues would not allow tax collectors to worship together with them. 
Now, could you imagine being a person of faith and wanting to do like we do to go worship with other people of faith? And because of what you do, and maybe even the way you do it, they said, no, nah, you ain't worshiping with us at all. That's for sure. So this is the life that this very rich guy lives. I find an interesting contrast with the ruler that we saw that was rich a few weeks ago when Leonard brought the message. You might recall that that guy was extremely rich, but there was something the text there told us is that he was very faithful to obey the commandments. Remember that? So would he have been despised like Zacchaeus was? No. In fact, he probably would have been esteemed. So there's a real big difference, I think, between these two people. Zacchaeus is probably the same kind of guy, too, that people were polite to his face, but behind his back, what are they doing? They're cursing him. They're talking about how evil he is and how worthless he is, all that kind of stuff. Hardly ever would they say that to his face, though, right? Because this is the guy that controls how much tax you're going to have to pay, and you want to keep that guy happy. My father-in-law shared with me years ago that when he was in the construction trade, what he would do at holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas is he would take in a gift basket to the building inspectors. And at a certain level, what's he doing? He's, he's trying to grease the palm a little bit, right? So that when they come out to look at his job, they're going, yeah, we're all good and, and kind of moving on. This is the world that I think Zacchaeus lives in. What I find fascinating, and hopefully you do as well, Zacchaeus, at least in his own mind, was a VIP. He's somebody who's very important, has a lot of authority, a lot of sway and influence in his community. Yet here's a guy that we see that seems to be very desperate, I would say, to meet Jesus, who I think is the real VIP. Would you agree? I mean, is there any person of greater importance than Jesus? I think not. But what we see here in the text is it says that he wants to see who Jesus is, which would imply that he's not even met him or even seen him before. And so he's trying to do everything he can to get in position, but he's got a problem. One of the problems is, is this crowd has grown. Since Jesus has made his way down from up north towards Jerusalem, there's a larger and larger group of people that are traveling with him. And Zacchaeus can't get in through the crowd, but he's also got another problem. What does the text say about him? He was short. <laughs> now, I did a little research on this, and they're, they're not 100% certain about it, but it would appear that the average male in the area of Jerusalem in the first century was probably about 5'2 to 5'4. That was the average. That's probably about the size, height-wise, that Jesus would have been. So if that was the height as an average, what does that make Zacchaeus? Wow, I, I mean, I, I would feel tall, you know, <laughs> in that time, right? But here's Zacchaeus, probably down under 4'6", possibly. And you think as the crowd is there, they go, oh, this poor little short guy, let's, let's let him in so he can see, right? And I'm like, that's Zacchaeus, right? <laughs> kind of sticking their elbows out, right? They're not doing anything to try to help this guy see what's going on. So here Zacchaeus does two things that I believe no other first century VIP would have done because it was so improper. First of all, he runs. Now keep in mind in those days, they didn't have shorts and pants like we do. They had long flowing robes, right? And so if you ran, if you weren't tucked up just right, okay, a little like a hospital gown sort of thing, just getting you the picture there, right? So a guy like this would not have been running down the street. But it seems as he's running, he's even thinking. Because he thinks, you know, I can get further ahead, but the crowd is just going to come along, and they're probably going to block me out just like they have been. And so what does he do? He does the second thing I don't think a VIP of the first century would have done. He climbs a tree. Just like a kid, he climbs up in this tree. In essence, so that he's got a bird's eye view looking down on Jesus that nobody could block his view. It's interesting, this tree. This is a good example of Bible study and how we need to pay a little closer attention sometimes to what the text says. The text doesn't just tell us that Zacchaeus climbed a tree. It tells us that he climbed a what? 
a sycamore tree. Now, we might think of a sycamore tree in the way we would in our own country, but this was a very special kind of tree in the first century. It was actually a pretty good-sized tree for the desert. I mean, it would often grow 12 to 15 feet tall on the average. Some of them could be at least six feet in diameter, the trunks of these trees. They had these big, huge leaves. And because of the foliage, it would block the sun really well, and they very often planted them along the roadways. So as travelers going through the desert, they would get some degree of shade as they were going along, kind of get a sense of how they used this tree. The leaves were shaped like a heart. And for that reason, many people called it a mulberry fig, because the leaf was very similar to a mulberry. But here's what's interesting about it as a fig tree. The fig of a sycamore was inferior to the normal figs. A normal figs, once they were ripe, you just go pull them off the branch and you eat them. Just that easy to harvest. But a sycamore fig, if you did not pierce it, the fruit, at least three or four days before you were going to harvest it, it was very bitter. It, it wasn't tasty at all. And for that reason, it was often called the poor man's fig tree because most people wouldn't bother with a sycamore tree because there was other fig trees that could be harvested. But what the poor would often do is they would go pierce these fruit, allow the air to penetrate to the fruit, turn it from being bitter to being sweet. There's an interesting thought for us there that I would ask you to hang on to, but we'll come back to. Amos tells us that he was a caretaker, Amos the prophet from the Old Testament, of the sycamore fig trees, which is in itself a little fascinating if you know about the promise or the prophet Amos. I also find it fascinating that here's a very rich man perched in a poor man's tree. Kind of an interesting situation there. Notice that Jesus, when he comes along, he looks and he sees Zacchaeus up there and he says, Zacchaeus, hurry. By the way, this is the only time in Scripture that Jesus ever turned, told anybody to hurry. Larry and I have kind of talked about this recently, but you know, both of us kind of have this thing, I'm in a hurry, but I don't know why. Kind of, kind of like the country song, right? And some of us just live lives like that. We've always got the pedal down. We're in a hurry to get somewhere. We don't even maybe know why we have to be there in such a rush, but we're doing it, right? But here's a, a unique thing. that We see our Lord telling Zacchaeus to hurry and come down. He does something that in youth culture today is sometimes called an SI. It's a little shorthand for texting. Anybody that knows what that stands for? It's called a self-invite. You know, he, he doesn't ask Zacchaeus, hey, you know, do you have, a, do you have room at the house? You know, I'd, I'd like to come over. He doesn't say, could I? He says, I must. He self-invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. In fact, in our culture, there's a thing called a super or an epic SI. That's when you go to an event even though they told you not to go. We've all maybe done that at some point, right? But what does Zacchaeus do? Zacchaeus gets out of the tree, and notice the language that it uses here. Here's a local VIP never met Jesus, very first time, he's literally had to get out of a tree to see him, and the text says that he joyfully received Jesus. It's kind of ironic when you put their characters together, because they're almost polar opposites. Here's Zacchaeus living a life of crime at some level. He's almost like a mafioso, you know, in the sense of how he collects money from people and does what he does. And here's Jesus, the pure son of God. But Zacchaeus joyfully receives him. Notice a word that the text uses. In the ESV, it uses the word stay. He doesn't say, I need to go to your house and have dinner. Because he's done that before with some others, right? In fact, when he recruited Levi, also known as Matthew, right? Matthew throws a party for Jesus at his house, throws a big dinner for all of his friends. But here's a situation where we read that Jesus is literally going to spend the night. The word literally means to lodge at Zacchaeus' home. Don't miss the crowd's reaction. In fact, put yourself there. The word on the street. 
The word on the street is, this could be the Messiah. This could be the one we're waiting for. After all these years, this is the guy. It's amazing what I've heard he's done. I've seen him heal the blind. That just happened down the road, right? And they're talking about him. And they're excited about what he's going to do. And then all of a sudden, he goes in the home of the most notorious scoundrel in the place. Our teaching team, when we were talking about this this week, we were trying to put it into modern terms. You know, it would be almost like Jesus going into the house of Hillary Clinton, some said, right? <laughs> or, or some others say, in the house of Trump, right? Or, you know, into the house of the lady who runs the Planned Parenthood Association or whatever. But just think of whoever that person is that in your mind is somebody notoriously despised who is totally against the things that you stand for and Jesus goes to their house. In fact, doesn't even receive an invitation, makes his own invitation to go to that guy's house. Not your house, not my house, not the head of the synagogue's house, but to the scoundrel's house. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here. And the crowd's not happy about it. What I like here is that Jesus was never swayed from his mission by man's opinion. Let me say that again. Jesus was never swayed from his mission by man's opinion. Amen. Amen. Shame on us when we let man's opinion of us sway us from the mission. Now, part of the problem the crowd has is they misunderstand Jesus' mission. See, the crowd thinks that he's supposed to deliver them from the bondage of the Romans, to kick the Roman government out, to take the throne, to lead their country again, just like the great King David did. That's what they're expecting for Jesus to do, to rule and reign on the throne of David. That's what they're looking for. But as we discover in our passage, that's not what Jesus is there for. Jesus has a different mission. Join with me there in verse 8. It says, Zacchaeus stood... And said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. There's a word right in the beginning of our verses here that's easy to pass over because it says that Zacchaeus stood, which would kind of indicate that he had been reclining at some point. And he stands up. But it's a word that's used for somebody that stands up to give a formal declaration. It would be like the best man at a wedding. All of a sudden steps up, stands up, and people just know he's going to give a toast, right? That's what Zacchaeus is doing. Is he's standing up, but not before a crowd, but before Jesus. Now, this is the other thing that's hard for us to know in the passage. It doesn't tell us when specifically he does this. Could this have been after he got out of the tree? Maybe he fell down and then he stood up? One possibility. Is it at dinner at his house that he stands up and makes this declaration? Is it the next morning as Jesus and his guys are getting ready to leave? Does he stand up before them at the breakfast table and make the announcement? We don't know. Verse 9 does seem to indicate that it does take place at his house, though, because Jesus says salvation has come to this house today. So it does seem like it happens later after the tree. Notice the contrast, though, again, with that law-abiding rich ruler. When he went to Jesus, and I got the verse here for you, it's out of chapter 18, verse 18, he said, good teacher. That's the way this law-abiding Jew, this rich ruler, honors and directs what he has to say to Jesus. How does Zacchaeus direct himself in his formal statement? Notice the word? What is it? It's the word Lord. He's honoring him as master. Wow, isn't that ironic? Where the one guy said he had kept all the commandments, for sure, Zacchaeus had broke some of them, if not most of them, right? The lawbiter only calls him a good teacher, but the lawbreaker calls him Lord. 
you're starting to get a sense that there's something that's happened in Zacchaeus' life. I was doing that earlier, calling him some zucchini thing. I'll, I'll stop that again. I haven't had zucchini even recently. But, but notice what he does. He takes responsibility. What I love about this is Zacchaeus takes responsibility for his bad behavior. That's a mark not only of humility, by the way, but of maturity. When people own their stuff, what they've done wrong, that's humble. It's even more mature when they will go and ask for forgiveness for their bad behavior. But here's Zacchaeus saying, I'm going to own what I've done. In fact, half of my possessions, I'm going to give it away to the poor. <laughs> that should capture your attention when we go back to the rich ruler. Because remember, the ruler asked, what must I do, good teacher, to inherit eternal life? What did Jesus tell him? Give 100% of it away, give it all to the poor, then you can come follow me. Does Jesus jump in and correct Zacchaeus and go, wait, wait, I already told the other guy, this was just a few days ago, but here's the thing. You can't just give 50%, you've got to give it all away to the poor, then you can come follow me. Is that what he does? No. Why? It's because it isn't about the amount. It's about the heart of the giver. Notice that the rich ruler asked what he should do. He says, okay, Jesus, tell me what I should do. Jesus tells him. He walks away and goes, eh, that doesn't work for me. On the other hand, Zacchaeus comes to Jesus and said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give half of my stuff to the poor. In fact, the people I've defrauded, I'm going to give them four times as much back. If I took $100, I'm going to give them $400. That, by the way, is a lot more than what the law of Moses required. The law, according to Leviticus 6, says that he's supposed to give 20% more back. If you make restitution to somebody, if you stole or defrauded somebody $100, you should give them back $120. That's the proper form of restitution. All of this for me, and hopefully for you, shows what about Zacchaeus? He's a changed person. He's changed. He's not the same guy anymore. Not just on the outside, but on the inside. He's been transformed. I love that Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. But don't miss why, because this is something that's easy to get wrong. It's not because Zacchaeus said he was going to give 50% of his stuff away. Is it? Is it? No, it's not because of that. It's not because he said he was going to make restitution fourfold. It's not because of that. Jesus tells us why it is, but we even have to read that closely. He says, since this man is also a son of Abraham. Is Jesus trying to say that just simply because he's a physical descendant of Abraham, the great forefather of the Jewish people, is it simply because he's in that lineage that salvation has come to the house? No. No. In fact, Paul talks about this very thing in the letter to the churches of Galatia. And here's what he said. He said, Abraham believed God. And God counted him, Abraham, as righteous. Why? Because of his faith. Notice what he says. The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. See, it doesn't matter what lineage you come from. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew, a Gentile, a slave, or a free, male or female. Paul, in the same writing in Galatians, says we're all one in Christ Jesus. That's the thing. If you believe in the name of Jesus Christ, then you too can have salvation come to your house. Praise God, right? I mean, it's just, frankly, that simple. And what we see in the last verse that I shared, verse 10, is I believe the clearest and simplest statement of Jesus' mission, that he came to seek and save the lost. That's what he's there for. He didn't come to rule and reign on the throne of David. That's coming. But what he came for in that first century was to seek and save the lost. And who were one of those people that were desperately lost? Zacchaeus. And that's why Jesus wanted to go to his home. 
One thing that I would give you as a truth to take away today, and this is, I think, a big deal. Jesus seeks sinners. Do you have any doubt about that? You should have no doubt about it. Jesus seeks sinners, not just in the first century, but today. He's seeking sinners. But it's only the ones who recognize and know they're lost that find him. That's one of the problems they had in the first century. So many of them, the rich ruler included, did not think they were bad enough to need a savior. You ever met anybody like that? Maybe even yourself at one time? You thought your goodness, the fact that you were obedient and faithful, that God should give you extra credit for all those things. Does he, by the way? No, never. It's all back to the same idea. It's only by our faith and trust in Christ. I think a lot of people in our world suffer from this problem. Jesus, again, is still seeking the lost, seeking sinners today. But many in our world, even especially in this country, don't see themselves as lost or as sinners. Gallup did a poll you know, in, in the United States not long ago. This is May of 2017. And they had a number of all-time highs that came back. And this was acceptability of these practices. 73% of Americans believe at an all-time high that divorce is okay. 73%. Highest ever in history. Sex between an unmarried man and woman, highest it's ever been, 69%. Gay and lesbian relations, 63%. Highest it's ever been. Having a baby outside of marriage, 62%. Highest that it's ever been. Doctor-assisted suicide, 57%. Highest that it's ever been. We're in a crazy culture today where right is wrong and wrong is right. And part of the challenge of getting the message out about Jesus today is most people don't see that they're lost. They don't see that they're in disagreement with what Scripture says about how they should be living their life. And that's one of the things that we have to do. So we have to bring the Word of God to them so that they see, wow, the way I'm living is not how God would be okay with it. And not unlike Zacchaeus, in fact, I've committed a few of those sins on that list, right? Some of you, I'm guessing, have committed a few of the sins on that list. That there is forgiveness for that if you put your faith and trust in the name of Jesus. Unfortunately, for people to hear the bad news, or excuse me, the good news sometimes, they first have to hear the bad news. When I look at Zacchaeus' determination to see Jesus, one of the questions that I really had to ask myself is why. Why is it that this guy, who's got it pretty darn good in the first century, you know, he's the big man around town, why is it that he's so desperate to even just see Jesus? See, I believe that Zacchaeus is a little bit like that sycamore fig. His heart has already been pierced. He's already become convicted of his sinfulness. He's in recognition that he's a person who is lost before God. And this is before Jesus ever comes to town. When Jesus comes to town, he's ripe for harvest. Because that bitterness on the inside of him has been sweetened as it was pierced in the conviction that he had over his sin by the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus comes along, that's why he's so quickly receiving him. I also kind of wonder if Zacchaeus happens to be the tax collector that we've read about a few weeks ago. Remember the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector at the temple, and they're both praying? You know, the Pharisee is bragging about how good he is, and at least he's not one of those guys like the tax collector over there. Is it possible that this is Zacchaeus? That he's the guy who is crying out to God, begging for forgiveness, beating his breast, recognizing that he's a sinner. Now, to be clear, the text doesn't tell us, but it would sure seem just like our Lord to have had that kind of insight that Zacchaeus had been up at the temple days before he ever got to town, crying out to his father. And so when Jesus comes to town, he goes, Zacchaeus, we need to talk. And he spends the night at his house. Another truth I give you to take away today is that a genuine relationship with Jesus changes a person's priorities. To be clear, I've put the word genuine in here. 
I have met and I am convinced that the rich ruler thought he had a relationship with God because he was faithful and obedient to the commandments. He thought he had a relationship. I personally thought I had a relationship with God at one point, but it was not genuine. Maybe some of you can identify with that. Because one of the ways you know when you have a genuine relationship with God is things happen like they did with Zacchaeus. Your priorities change. What's important to you changes. The reason that Zacchaeus gave away 50% of his treasure is that wasn't what life was all about anymore for him. Has that happened for you? Have you reached a place that because of the genuineness in your relationship with Jesus Christ, that you are now being sacrificial with your treasure, with your time, and with your talent? Because I recognize in my own heart at a certain point in my life that although I thought and claimed a relationship with Christ, if you looked at my life, it wasn't much different than anybody else's. There was very little time I devoted to the things of God, very little finances that I devoted to the ministry of God. But when God finally got a hold of my heart, it changed my priorities. I think there's no question about the fact that it changed Zacchaeus' priority. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So where is it today for you that your treasure is? Now, maybe you're not hung up in stuff. You know, you're not worried about money. You're not worried about the big house, the big car, whatever. But maybe your treasure is in something different, like a relationship other than God. And it's not that God has a problem with us having relationships. He just wants us to have relationships according to the way that he's determined for us to have relationships, right? And when we put God at the top, he's the highest priority relationship we have. How does that impact those other relationships? Do they get better or worse? Most of them are going to get better, especially if it's someone else who has God at the top in relationship. Now, of course, those are the exceptions. That person who doesn't want anything to do with God, and all of a sudden you're all on fire with God, they're probably not going to want to have anything to do with you, right? The text doesn't tell us, but history records that Zacchaeus dedicated not only his treasure to following Christ, but his time and talents. One of the church fathers, Clement of Alexandria, records that Zacchaeus became the episcopos, the word is bishop of the church at Caesarea. Here's a guy who is a chief tax collector, devoting his time, talent, and treasure primarily to himself. But because he met and came to know who Jesus truly was, it radically changed him. And he gave up a bunch of his stuff, walked away from his job, and said, I'm going to devote my time and my talents to the kingdom of God. Is that a glorious thing or what? Amen. Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.